Thanks for that. Um, I'm now delighted to invite uh, Bernadette Kalski to come up and launch the um, magazine. I think Bernadette probably needs uh, no introduction, but she's the coordinator of the Migrant Rights South Her Own Empowerment Programme, the author of the classic The Price of My Soul. Um, she was obviously a civil rights campaigner and was elected to Westminster in 1969 uh, as an independent socialist and has been involved in radical politics ever since. So I'll just hand you over to Bernadette. Thanks very much, and and I think when you when you sit uh, and listen to the stark facts, the historical realities of what happened in in Guernica, you become very aware of the importance of the small things that we all have to do to ensure that history is never forgotten the real history of real people, which is reviews, reviewed and revised and distorted and made to fit new dispensations and new agendas routinely. So that almost in every generation, people have to relearn how to survive the battlefield, how to build the struggle, relearn the lessons that if we had the people's history, would be there to pass on. And that's why it is crucial that people continue to do this kind of work. That's why it's crucial to have this magazine. And I have no doubt that there will be people who will read it and they'll pick holes in it. God be with the whole pickers. <laughs> there will be people whose line is not right. There will be people who on page 43, 24 or 26, paragraph 2, end of the sentence, clearly expose themselves as reprobates, reformists, liberals, something or other that's really not good enough and won't win a revolution. But. If we didn't produce magazines like this, the poor hole pickers would have nothing to do. <laughs> and we would never have those intrinsic debates that enable us to strive to be ever better and purer in our pursuits. And those things too have their place. We would never have debate, we'd never have discussion. And the, the, the thing that I like most about this group of people and their productions of magazines and articles and their setting out of history is their willingness across the broad progressive radical revolutionary perspective mm -hmm. to listen to other perspectives to allow that difference of perspective to be heard rather than to close it out and say, because you think slightly different from me, you're not allowed to write in my glossy magazine, and you're not allowed to come to my event, and you're not allowed to have launched my magazine. Because one of the things that we desperately need at the minute is the vibrancy of informed discussion is the vibrancy of exchange and debate in mutual respect of shared purpose and vision, real debate and real discussion about how we begin to move the world forward from the very, very dangerous place in which it currently is. Because as we sit and, 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 and hear what happened in that small town, because by today's standards, that's a, it's a small market town. It's actually not much bigger than the modern town of Coal Island uh, at, at the minute. And interestingly enough, also a small town in Northern Ireland whose population has dramatically increased because of refugees and 
new migrants and people fleeing poverty, fleeing destruction, fleeing war. But if we ask ourselves, apart from the strategic importance, apart from what the key warmongers were doing, apart from the key messages that were being sent out, what allowed people? What allowed the guy in the plane to keep doing that? What, what allowed the people to keep coming and keep killing women and children and knowing that that's what was happening? It's not that they didn't know. What allowed them to do it? Because whatever that was, it is exactly the same operation of human empathy, dignity, humanity that allows people to do it today. Because it doesn't matter which side of the argument you hold on who's responsible for what in Syria. Just think Guernica and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. And ask, have we learned nothing? Have we learned nothing in the time in between? Did we learn nothing from the Second World War? Did we learn nothing of the tens and hundreds of wars, big and small, that have been fought between? So what is it that allows a human being to engage in the mass destruction of their fellow and sister human beings? And there's only one thing, you know, you can put in a lot of ingredients, but there's only one thing that allows it to happen. At the point in which it's happening, the perpetrator does not believe that their victims are entitled to the status of human beings. You couldn't do it otherwise. You couldn't do it and go home and not go and see it. You couldn't do it and go home and not live with the demons of it for the rest of your life. Unless you can persuade yourself, and it's remarkable how little persuasion it seems to take, that once you can identify any group of people as less than human, you can exterminate them. So it's not that complicated. That's a simple, simple message. I think it was somewhere in Shakespeare it said, those whom the God would, the gods would destroy, they first make mad. <coughs> But those whom the powerful would destroy, they first dehumanize. And so the lesson for us, I think, today is to try and try and look at the world that we live in. What is happening today? What is happening globally? What's happening nationally? What is happening locally? And what are the stark, frightening parallels? of today, do we see that if we knew the truth of the 30s, if we cut through the historical large lies, fake news, fake news, I just, I, I'm, I'm, there's a while a couple of years ago I said if I go to a meeting and anybody mentions Jerry Adams I'm not staying because people were obsessed with talking about the man and I now feel myself if I go to a meeting and hear myself mention Donald Trump I'm going to leave because we're becoming obsessed with the man but he talks about fake news and it's interesting it's interesting how this man has colonized the uh, and I'm going to say this very carefully, but he has colonized the cryptic, semi-inarticulate language 
of what the Black Panther movement in the 60s called the American lump on the proletariat. So he talks like a redneck. He says things like, big lie. Things that you see on the internet, you know, I love it. If you know the people who write on Facebook, please don't do it. <laughs> the word is flat, full stop. Fact, full stop. And they think that if you write that, that's what makes it true. Big full stop, fact. And, and Trump talks like that. And we all laugh at him. But in talking like that, he talks the language of ill-informed people who are hurting because their lives are shit, but who are led to believe daily that something less than human, some other species less than human, is the cause of it. The foreigner, the migrant, the refugee, the alien, <coughs> the Muslim. And what scares me most about the, about the present time is that when you, you know, some time back, I'm old enough, I'm not going to tell you how old. Go on, go on, right tell us, go on. No, no, it's a secret. <laughs> you will, you will, you will. For a day or two. But, there was a time, you know, when we were young, we called everybody over the age of 30 a fascist. That was in the 60s. <laughs> what defined a fascist? Age. Over the age of 30, in the 60s, tough. Fascist. <laughs> Teachers, fascist. <laughs> Parents, fascists. Anybody who said you needed a license to get a motorcycle, which was really a scooter, <laughs> fascist. <laughs> And then wiser people like Betty Sinclair of the Communist Party would say to us, don't call people fascists when they're not. Because when you have to confront fascism, you need to know what it looks like. And it's very, very important that we know today what fascism looks like. What makes the individual fascist? What makes the fascist movement and what makes the global authoritarian fascist state? What are the ingredients in that? And I think that we need to know them because I think that we are facing in this time and this generation, which is mostly yours, I feel a bit like Betty Sinclair, actually, because we used to say, what's that old woman talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you are facing, globally, the rise of fascism. And so the simplistic understandings that you have, historically, of what fascism, fascism is, need to be challenged and corrected. Fascism is not German. Fascism is not German. Fascism is not the Nazism of the Second World War. Predates that. And fascism is not a phenomenon of that period of Western Europe. Fascism like capitalism from which it grows, like racism, like xenophobia from which it grows, is a global phenomenon. It is an approach to life. And it starts in the heads of individuals. And it is promoted there. People's perception and way of understanding the world is encouraged to consider that what keeps you disadvantaged, what means you don't have enough, is that that lesser breed, that's what it is, it's lesser breeding, that lesser breed has taken what belongs to you. Might be your land, might be your job, but ultimately it's the air that you breathe. And there's a great Alice Walker poem about first they said, you know, what was wrong with us all. First they said we were stupid and then we realised we want. And at the end of this poem, 
the people realise that what is annoying the fascist is our very existence. Those who will not conform, those who will not believe, those who will not accept, those who will not obey, it is our very existence on the face of this earth that threatens the social order, that threatens the well-being of society, that threatens the economic order. So there would be enough money in the National Health Service if certain kinds of people didn't exist. If we could reduce the population to the deserving, to those entitled, there would be enough to go around. And that's the core, that's the core issue. So who are the deserving? Historically, historically, the deserving are those people who somewhere back in the distant past plundered and stole and raped and acquired by murder and destruction land and property and power. And then, having taken it in violence, having taken it in war and plunder, fashioned laws to prevent anybody taking it back. And so, let's look at the position of the bankers. The bankers stole your money was not called theft. It's not called theft because there are bits of paper and laws that prevent you calling it theft. But simple logic will tell you, you don't have the money you're entitled to and you know where it went. And you didn't give it to them. So logically they took it without your consent. And the word for that is theft. And the only thing that prevents it from being a theft is that those in power create processes and paperwork and structures which call it something else. So by what other names are we calling the rise of fascism? Democracy is one of them. I, I'm watching poor bleeding heart liberals in America. My heart is breaking for them. Not. I've, I, I long ago learned a simple litmus test for liberals. Throw them in the deep end. They will learn to swim or they'll give us no problems. <laughs> and most of the more smart people, they'll learn to swim. But hanging around the edges, waiting for the liberals to catch on, is not something I was ever any good at. So I'm watching liberals in America, as they watch this man threaten, threaten world war, because he can. This man pokes sticks at North Korea because he can. And liberals saying, well, we, well, he was democratically elected. So was Hitler. So was Hitler. Democratically elected. So maybe one of the things we have to do in trying to unpick and understand what is fascism today is to begin to understand what is democracy. Maybe we have to have a 21st century conversation on what is democracy? Has democracy been reduced to an electoral process that seduces everybody and delivers very little? Especially in a globalized world where the power and authority of the world within its economic machinations are not held within these nation state institutions. So, if democracy is simply about politics of the creation of governments and constitutions, you know, if we're still in the age of enlightenment, 
which is the 18th century. Do we need a 21st century definition of what democracy is over and beyond the machinations of one individual, one vote, be that at 21, 18, or 16? Is it democracy that we can debate what happens in the Dáil or what doesn't happen in the Executive, because we don't have one in the North at the minute, or what happens in Westminster, which isn't functioning at the minute either? And if these things are the core of democracy, how does the world keep going on when they collapse? We're having a ball in the North. I don't see anybody that hasn't been able to get out of bed, go to their work, do their work, rear their children, pay their debts, not pay their debts because there's no government. The only thing that's not working is the government. The rest of the world's going on. People are still eating out of food bikes, still getting a minimum wage. Factories are still making money. Chickens are still eating and getting killed and put in the production line and packing it up so that people can poison themselves or whatever. All those things are going on. So if we want to understand fascism today, do we need to understand democracy? And the reason I asked that was I was watching TV last night, uh, just watching the news on, on after, the, after the shooting of, of the gendarme in, in Paris. And there was a discussion with young French people. Uh, interestingly enough, young French males, just, just as it happened, there were no women in that group. But one of the young people were saying about the changes that would need to, to happen, and she, he was supporting Marie Le Pen. And in the midst of what he was saying, he said, you know, because we have to protect democracy, and the unit of democracy is the nation state. I just went, wow. The unit of democracy is a nation state. Now, the last time that that was effectively publicly debated was between, oh, right at the start of the French Revolution, was between the Republicans, led by Thomas Paine, and essentially the nation state or nationalists, not individual country nationalists, but nationalists as a, as a concept. And the Republicans, of whom I am one, but the Republican argument was, and I might ask it here, how many people here do think that the unit of democracy might be the nation state? We thank God for small parties. <laughs> The Republicans argued that the unit, first basic unit of democracy is the individual. That's why it kind of is open to becoming a very individualist way of thinking if it's not placed all the time within the context of socialism. So if you're a Republican that's not a socialist Republican, you either will have to become a socialist Republican as you grow up and learn more, or you will end up being a nationalist. Sinn Féin being the case in point. So you either have to go, republicanism can't exist outside of, of a context. But when you start to think that the nation state, which is the argument that, that the, the nationalists put up, was that when people delegate their power, when people vote, the nation then becomes the collective voice of the people. And the people cannot disagree with the nation. The nation then becomes almost like one big human being. And the more diverse our nation states have become in the modern world, the more difficult it is for that notion to hold sway. Because before we had nation states, the bringing of nations, which were people, people who shared a culture, people who shared a language, people who shared a way of life, uh, be that nomadic or whatever. Nations, nations in the world around nations were kinships and people, and states were territories that were owned by kings and aristocrats. 
And then the bringing of these two together, first of all under monarchies, was the creation of nation states. And the carving up of pieces of ground that belonged to certain monarchs. And they created that bond of us versus them and the territory that divided us from the next state. And because our own history of the development of capitalism in Europe and imperialism in Europe, which sent the British and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the Germans to rape and plunder the rest of the world. It was necessary if you were going to do that with your weapon in one hand and your Bible in the other. To persuade both the people at home and the people abroad that there was something fundamentally being superior about being white, about being European, and about being Christian. And very few of us in this room have any real conscious awareness of how deeply embedded that is in all our psyche. So that if we're not consciously learning and challenging it, we slip into that way of thinking. So we have a problem. We have a problem in that even though Trump, I don't think he's a fascist, he's a populist. He's a fascist too. And even though he is that, pitched against North Korea, he is, as they would say in the old days, our food. <laughs> he's white, he's Christian, he's male, and he's on the side of Europe. We look at the same thing when we look at Syria. How many of us actually know what's happening in Syria? I don't. I try to understand it, but I don't fully understand it. And part of the reason I don't fully understand it, and part of the reason I don't fully understand ISIS, and part of the reason I don't fully understand all of that, is that there is nothing in my history, education, learning, that enables me to understand that context historically, like I understand my own. I know nothing, I know nothing of the, in terms of the comparative knowledge I have of, my, of the history of Western Europe. I know nothing of the history of the Middle East. I know nothing of the development of Islam as a religion, although no longer considering myself a member of any religion. I could push to it, give you the credo in unum deum from beginning <laughs> Because it's bred in me, it's rote learned in me, and it impacts on my psyche. And so here we are. Here we are with our first problem. We are intellectually, historically, and politically ill-equipped to understand what is happening in the rest of the world at this point. And yet it doesn't stop us all doing things about it. If we go back to when we looked at other times, what makes it a global movement? At this point in history, there is one single group of people, much like the 30s, there's one single group of people, doesn't matter where you are, where you are, America, Europe, Paris, Dublin, the single most dangerous group of people in the world is what? We all know. Who are the most dangerous people on the face of the world today? Yeah. White people. Well, exactly. Civilized. But that's not what people think. People walk in terror of Muslims. Yeah. Yeah. Or to make it sound less, less offensive in the North, God, we're good in the North at hiding things. For some reason, people in the North say Muslims. Then they think the racism isn't so vulgar. It's easier to say we don't like Muslims than, than, than to insult people of, of a culture, people of a nation, a nation rather than a nationality or a state. 
and people of the faith all mixed in. But the global enemy today is the Muslim. In much the same way that almost every ill, the poverty of the 30s, the inequality of East and West, almost everything in the 30s could be blamed on the Jew. And that is now the Muslim. And we buy it. We buy it. We don't challenge it. We get on with the economic realities, but we don't challenge that core issue. The issue that will define us in this, in this that will define this generation in the future will be the bodies drowning in the Mediterranean. Will be the lives destroyed in Syria. Will be the people who died in refugee camps. When we had room for them all. We had room for them all. The big lie that there isn't room, that you have to manage it, there's no room, is a lie. Same as the Guernica lie. And we're sleepwalking to a third world war. And then whenever I'm long gone, people say, she said that. People always say that about 15 years after I say something, and they say, you shouldn't have said that. I said, she said that, she was right. But we are. We are sleepwalking towards an international war. And you know why we're doing that? Capitalism needs a war. The solution to the economic problems of the Western world is giving people jobs, making more weapons. So we're going to have people making more weapons. We need to get rid of the weapons we've got. What will we do them? Drop them on the people who are less than human. Hit North Korea. What will they do? Hit back and miss, they hope. Bomb Syria. Destroy Afghanistan. Destroy the infrastructure of the entire Middle East. And, and never ever mention Africa. <laughs> A whole world. From South Africa to Tunisia. A whole world torn apart. With a legacy of imperialism and capitalism and rape and plunder and racism turned in on itself continually still plundered and full of fascists, full of them. Governments killing their own people, little puppet states. But we don't even, we don't even worry about that. Why not? Because maybe they're not real people. Maybe Africa is not a real big place like Europe. Maybe the authoritarians and the dictators in African countries are only killing Africans and they might get our life. Or maybe something <coughs> very deep down in the white European psyche says Africans aren't real people. It'll only be war if it comes home to us. So when we're doing these, this is important. Never underestimate the importance of the people who remind you what happened in the past. Because if you forget, you will be made to remember when in your lifetime, if not mine, it will happen again. Thank you. Questions in three, so for Bernadette Aranda. Any questions? 